welcome back. So, now let us look at another problem in which there is uh, there are non identical measurements for both agents, uh, it, but in this case neither of the agents will have a trivial information. So, the problem now is of non identical and non trivial measurements. So, what are we going to assume? We are going to assume that the information now of agent 1 is, is sigma of omega 1 comma omega 2 omega 3. So, omega 2 omega 3 have been put in one set for agent 1 and similar and for agent 2 we write it here for agent 2 we have the information of agent 2 is sigma of omega 1 omega 2 comma omega 3. So, agent uh, so agent 1 is not able to distinguish between omega 2 and omega 3. So, for as far as agent 1 is concerned omega 2 and omega 3 are identical for him and uh, for agent 2 omega 1 and omega 2 are identical for him. He can distinguish between omega 3 and omega 1 or omega 2 this was the case uh, in one of our earlier examples as well. But a, and agent 1 on the other hand can uh, uh, distinguish between omega 1 and not omega 1. So, he cannot distinguish between omega 2 and omega 3. Okay. So, now the policies for the two agents take the following form. You can write say a, a typical policy for agent 1 as gamma 1 of y 1 equals equal to some a b. If y 1 is equal to omega 1 he has he takes an action a or if y 1 is equal to omega 2 or omega 3 then he takes an action b. Similarly, for agent 2 you have gamma 2 of y 2 that takes an where he takes an action c suppose an action d c if y 2 is um, equal to let us say omega 3 and uh, d uh, or let us say y 2 equal to c if, uh, if y 2 is equal to omega 1 or omega 2 and d if y 2 is equal to omega 3. So, these uh, you can see as, uh, thanks to this now both agents will now have 4 different policies. So, there will be 4 policies for agent 1 here 4 policies here for agent uh, agent 2 as well as uh, um, uh, uh, as we had earlier. So, there are these you would have 4 different policies and now you would combine them into a matrix which would be a 4 cross 4 which means a 16 entry matrix and uh, write you would have to write out the cost for each pair of policies that would be that would give you your function j once you once you write out a, this this 4 cross 4 cross 4 matrix you would get j here uh, from there and then you look for the entry that has the least uh, the least possible cost and that will all that will then tell you the policies that the agents should be choosing right and i now this is this i have done this now for several examples so i will i will not go into the details of this particular example but i will just tell you what the op correct answer is so that you can check this on your uh, on your own. So, it turns out gamma 1 star of y 1 the optimal choice for player uh, for agent 1 is is. So, this is for agent 1 this is for agent 2 optimal choice for agent 1 is is u d y 1 u if uh, if y 1 equals omega 1 and d otherwise. So, that means y 1 is equal to omega 2 or omega 3 and the optimal choice for agent 2 is gamma 2 star of y 2 that is equal to R L if y 2 is equal to omega 1 or omega 2 and uh, L if y 2 is equal to omega 3. This, uh, these are 
the um, these are the optimal choices for uh, for the two agents. Now, uh, th that's what uh, uh, you you can compute the uh, the cost for uh, for every pair of policies and verify that these are in fact optimal. Now, uh, what we have uh, what we see when we have a sort of non-identical uh, non-identical uh, um, information for each agent is that we have to essentially enumerate every pair of policies and uh, there, there is not much uh, one can do or except for this there are some things we can do a little bit more smartly but that is that is pretty much uh, the best uh, we, uh, we can do so far as uh, computing the optimal policy is concerned. Now, uh, so, in general what happens in a, st in a static team problem can be, can be sort of seen in the following way. You know this has happened in the previous problem where there were non-identical measurements as, as also in this problem. Uh, so, in every problem with non-identical measurements you would see something of this form playing out. So, what is that? So, notice that what we want to do is minimize uh, with this j uh, with, uh, which is a function of gamma 1 and gamma 2 with respect to both gamma 1 and gamma 2 together right. This is what we want to do. Now, what we can do is actually write this out in the following way we can say well this is we can choose uh, uh, to minimize with respect to one of them first and then the other. So, here I am minimizing first with respect to gamma 2 and then with respect to uh, gamma 1 and I will also write out the expression I have for j which is the expectation of L of gamma 1 of y 1 comma gamma 2 of y 2 comma psi. Now, here uh, what I can do is the following I can use the law of iterated expectation and write out this inner expectation in a in an in a in a certain in a certain way. So, here I outside I have still minimize I am still minimizing over gamma 2 and inside what the what I will do with the expectation is I will take the expectation of a conditional expectation where I am conditioning now with respect to with respect to y 2. So, I condition take the conditional expectation of this L of this this comma psi given y 2 right. So, the conditional since this is a conditional expectation here effectively this here is with respect to the distribution psi given y 2 right. So, so this is this this conditional expectation has is is fixing y2 and uh, it's uh, it's being taken uh, with respect uh, of uh, with respect to the distribution of psi given y2. In fact, we can be more explicit here and instead of writing simply psi, we can write psi comma y1 given y2, knowing that both y1 and psi are after all random variables. Now, because you are minimizing. Uh, this inner thing the inner minimization is with respect to gamma 2 and then having the, 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 the function that we have inside here this here is a function of y 2 right. So, you have a, this here is for each fixed value of y 2. So, effectively what the when we want to choose the minimization with respect to gamma when we want to do a minimization with respect to gamma 2 we can effectively choose a value of action the action that gamma 2 chooses for each value of y 2. So, the what I mean is this minimization can actually go inside because whatever I have shown under the curly brackets is actually a function of, of y 2. So, therefore, this minimization becomes minimization outside with respect to gamma 1 and then you have an expectation here the outer expectation is with respect to here with respect to y 2. So, outer expectation is with respect to y 2 and inside I have a minimization of with respect to not the policy anymore, but rather the action chosen by agent by, by the agent. So, I am doing minimization with respect to u 2 of the condition of this inner conditional expectation, conditional expectation of L of gamma 1 of y 1 y 2 comma psi given y 2. So, this therefore gives us what this is effect, uh, what this is giving us 
is therefore now a scalar is, is a, a uh, finite dimensional optimization uh, uh, with respect to u2 and that can be computed for every value of y2 and then you from there we would get uh, uh, u2 star equal to gamma 2 star gamma 2 star of y2. But there is a little bit of a problem here you get that u2 star equal to gamma 2 star of y2 that is true. But, but remember this has been done for a fixed value of gamma 1. So, we are fixing a value of gamma 1 and that gamma 1 has made an appearance here. So, therefore, what we get is actually not the optimal gamma 2 uh, gamma 2 star of the problem, but the optimal response to gamma 1 of a so agent 2's optimal response to a, uh, to a policy gamma 1 chosen by agent 1 right so this is what you get is what we can call as the best response this is what is called the best response best response to uh, gamma 1 as a function uh, and as a function of y2 now, so effectively if one wants to compute uh, use this particular logic to compute uh, compute the optimal strategy what one now has to do is plug in this best response and view it as a function of gamma 1 and then outside minimize with respect to gamma 1 knowing that gamma 2 gamma 2 itself is chosen is itself going to change with with gamma 1. Right. So, knowing that gamma 2 is now replaced by its best response and that best response will itself keep changing with gamma 1. So, once we do this we can actually get uh, uh, we, we can actually compute the optimal uh, the optimal policy for the actual problem. So, once we do this we would in fact get gamma 1 star and then gamma 2 star of y 2 star comma gamma uh, comma gamma 1 star would then be the optimal policy. But notice that one of the things that is happening here is that once again we have we are, we are getting to a stage where we have when we need to know uh, we where we need to know uh, uh, the the entire function gamma 1 in order to compute even the optimal uh, best response. Uh, best response to it. So, the problem has once again become what we saw in the Witzenhausen problem where we have functions of functions coming up in uh, in the case of uh, in the case of these stochastic control problems. So, this also appears happens in a static team problem. So, remember I had warned you that static team problems are the simplest but not the easiest uh, problems they are simple but not necessarily easy they do not have the complications of uh, of uh, the uh, the of dynamic information structures uh, and and the dual effect and so on but that does not mean that finding stra optimal strategies for static teams is easy either it's it, it does need uh, some work and, and that's simply that's important that's because the best response uh, best responses are all entangled in this sort of way right so, so this is what uh, uh, what one inherently has uh, encounters in any static team problem, and to, uh, and the way around it is to simply list out every pair of policies, uh, one for agent one and one for agent two, and compute what is the optimal choice uh, for uh, for each of those policies. Having said that, there if there may be occasions where things are easier. For instance, uh, you know it may happen that uh, in some cases this inner minimization here uh, yields a very simple answer uh, for instance uh, or or maybe the inner the uh, the the, con the conditioning here is such that it makes the problem a lot easier for instance if one of the agents has trivial information then this the inner problem becomes rather easy and then therefore the uh, the outer problem can uh, uh, can then be can then be tackled uh, tackled much more easily so these are all optimized uh, you know ways of optimizing computations that we can do when we when we encounter problems like these now since uh, let's let's now go to the uh, another example uh, another example is this is this is an example in which so we let's now go to another example so in this example agents actually don't 
uh, do not get uh, the information of agents is not described directly uh, in terms of what part of uh, the uh, the uh, sample space of omega that they can they can actually see correctly it is not defined in terms of that but rather in terms of the value of another random variable that is correlated with psi. So, you can think of this as a case where agents are getting noisy measurements right. So, let us let us write this this example down. So, this in this example your agents are getting noisy measurements. So, it, it, as a simple example let us take the case where agent 2 does not get any measurement agent 2's information is empty. Uh, so, y 2 is empty or in other words um, i 2 here is sigma of omega 1, omega 2, omega 3 if you like to put it in that sort of way or and but y 1 now is equal to a, a random variable z and z itself takes values in uh, in a set of two different values which is z 1 and z 2. So, z can take two different values z 1 and z 2. Now, how what is uh, so obviously you would ask what is the relation between z and uh, z and omega. So, that is essentially where the crux of uh, this this particular case lies. So, z and omega are co uh, z and psi are actually correlated. So, you can let us write out these values here. So, these are the values uh, on the columns I have values of psi and on the rows I have values of, of z. So, here these are values of psi and on the rows. So, they psi can take values omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, z can take values z 1 or z 2 and these themselves occur with a certain probability. So, this is so what I am writing here therefore in this table is the joint distribution of psi and z. So, I will fill out some numbers here. So, this is 0 0.12, this is 0 0.18, this is 0 0.21, this is 0 0.09 this is 0 0.12 and this is 0 0.28. Now, we you can check that if you add up the columns here what we are effectively doing is taking the marginal distribution with respect to uh, uh, with respect to psi and the uh, columns when added up turn out to give you values 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 and that is that is nothing but the marginal distribution with respect to uh, with respect to psi and it is in fact the same marginal distribution that we had earlier. So, effectively what we have therefore, is that we have been given a joint distribution p of psi comma z uh, whose marginal distribution agrees with our earlier distribution ok. So, that is uh, so it is sort of a generalization of our earlier problem. So, now what we can do is the following we can what uh, the uh, what we one can do in this case is is we can uh, the the uh, the way to do this is we can actually change instead of thinking of uh, the uh, the environmental random variable as psi and z as being different from it what we can do is we can actually absorb z into the environmental randomness so effectively what uh, if you recall we I, I i mentioned in our intrinsic model of stochastic control that psi is supposed to include all the randomness in the problem so, the when we have any additional randomness which is coming from noisy measurements or something like that like we have here in this case what we do is we absorb that as into the definition of psi and in and redefine psi effectively. So, what we are if now what we will do is we will define we will just change psi to a new variable let us call that variable theta and theta is going to denote the pair psi comma z. So, psi has been replaced by theta where theta is simply the pair uh, psi comma z. Now, the probability distribution of theta the, uh, is given through the distribution uh, through the joint distribution that we have of psi comma z. So, theta can take 6 different values here. So, theta can take 6 different values let us call them theta denote them by a, a pair of indices theta i j it can take uh, 6 different values uh, given by uh, a pair like this omega i comma z j alright. So, you where i ranges from 
uh, 1 to 3 and j ranges from 1, 1 to 2. So, theta therefore can take 6 different values. So, theta takes so this here the uh, so the my my state space now or or the uh, sample space now is is this capital theta which is um, the collection of all these values theta i j where i equals uh, where theta i j is is this pair omega i comma z j i goes from 1 to 3 j equals 1 to 1 or 2 that is that is my uh, that is my value uh, that is my sample space theta. Now, the probability, distri probability distribution of theta. So, if I want to evaluate what is the probability that theta equals uh, theta i j then all I need to do is look it up in this particular table. This is therefore, the probability that psi equals omega i comma z equals z j and that can be found from this table. Right. So, for example, if you if I take if I wanted to know the value probability that theta equals theta 1 2 then that tells me the probability of that uh, that gives me that the probability of I am looking for then omega 1 and z 2. So, that is that then from this table is you can easily read that out is equal to 0 0.18 here. Okay. So, uh, that is uh, that is what uh, we can uh, we can now we can now see. So, how does this help? Uh, be, this this helps in the following way we have we have just what we have done is so far is just absorbed z into uh, into the environmental randomness of the problem. Now, what we need to do is make sure the other elements of the problem also fit in. So, in order to do that now let us look at uh, let us uh, let us look at how do we describe the information of all the agents. So, what we can do is the following see notice that here the information of agent 2 here is that he can observe omega 1 omega uh, he cannot distinguish between omega 1 omega 2 and omega 3 all right so he can he so so he has no way of uh, uh, of of distinguishing between omega 1 omega 2 and omega 3 so now what does this mean though in terms of uh, in terms of the state space uh, the uh, what does this mean though in terms of this in terms of the signals in terms of the value of in terms of the value of z. So, uh, the the agent has is basically getting no uh, no piece of information. So, as far as agent 2 is concerned he, he cannot distinguish even between values of z 1 and z 2 because he is unable to distinguish between uh, he, he really gets no information. So, we had earlier in our earlier model we had written his information as sigma of omega 1, omega 2, omega 3, but now that he really gets no information his information is really that he cannot distinguish between any of the values of theta. So, for agent 2 then let us let us write this out for agent 2 for agent 2 the for agent 2 his information is simply in this case a set which contains all the values of theta theta i j for i equal to 1 to 3 and j equal to 1 to 2 this is this is agent 2's information so agent 2 is unable to distinguish between any any value of z and any value of omega that's because he is getting really no information what about agent 1 now agent 1 things are a little bit more subtle so agent 1 remember is a, uh, can take can see perfectly the value of z so his information is equal to is equal to z here so he can see the value of z and thanks to that he, he uh, because he can see the value of z he, he, he is a, we can say that he is able to distinguish between one of the components of theta. Theta comprises of two components psi comma z and he is able agent uh, agent 1 is able to distinguish between the z component, but he cannot distinguish bit further between the values of omega which is the which is the psi component right. So, so we can we can write agent 1's information i 1 in the following way we can write this as as 
he he can he can uh, distinguish between these two sets the first set being the pair uh, all those values of theta in which z is equal to z1 so it's omega 1 comma z1 omega 2 comma z1 omega 3 comma z1 and the second is the set in which all there are the values of z2 so omega 1 comma z2 omega 2 comma z2 and omega 3 comma z2 so so agent 1 in this in this new space of of environmental random variables is able to now distinguish between these uh, between these values so he can distinguish between the values of theta in the first set from the values of theta in the second set but he cannot distinguish within the the sets themselves so he cannot tell whether uh, whether it's this theta that has occurred or this theta that has occurred but he can tell if this if uh, if if this if one of these has occurred or one of these has occurred right so this is therefore now becomes the information of of agent 1 so now what we have effectively done is basically changed our problem uh, to a different space. So, now our environmental random variable is not psi, but it is theta. So, everything is now written in terms of uh, in terms of theta. So, the cost also can be expressed in terms of theta. So, the we had L of u1, u2, comma psi, but this can always be written as L of u1, u2 comma theta where theta where the only component that is relevant as far as the cost uh, only component of theta that is relevant here is actually the uh, only the psi component matters only the psi component matter so and when we are computing the expected cost in uh, in this case we would again compute the expectation with respect to theta now remember because theta is now our uh, our random variable we will be taking the expectation with respect to theta so uh, having done this effectively now we can we can ask okay how many policies do we have for each agent well agent 2 having since he has no information uh, this this uh, agent 2 here has no information so as a result he has just two policies possible policies and agent 1 uh, because his information can take just two different different values and he can take two different actions he has four different policies so once again we can write out uh, the policies now on this particular space and uh, uh, you can you can see that uh, you uh, you can write out the policies for this particular space and and compute what the uh, what the optimal policy then would be. So, for example, if you had a policy which in which you had agent 1, gamma 1 is say d comma d u that means he is playing d in the first set, he is playing d if z 1 occurs and u if z 2 occurs okay, and gamma and gamma 2 is suppose l which means he is regardless of any anything else he is just playing l. In that case then what is the what would be j of gamma 1 comma gamma 2 one can write this out you can uh, we can write this as l of d l omega 1 times the probability now of uh, of omega 1 but remember prob when we are writing probability of omega 1 we have to write this as probability uh, in terms of probability distribution of theta so this is actually probability of omega 1 comma z1 plus you have l d then if you have omega 2 then you have that times probability of
d l omega 3 and then again you have probability of omega 3 comma z 1. So, what we have done here is basically taken out taken uh, a sum over the values uh, where uh, of theta theta 1 1 theta 2 1 and theta 3 1 effectively here. So, this is theta 1 1 this is theta 2 1 this is theta 3 1. Now, I need to do the same for for the other terms. So, I have then u l omega 1 times probability of omega 1 z 2 plus u l omega 2 probability of omega 2 comma z 2 plus probability plus l of u u l omega 3 probability of omega 3 comma z 2. Once we write all of these out, uh, so here we have uh, probability here this is probability of theta 1 2, this is theta 2 2, uh, the next term is theta 2 2, this is theta 3 2. Once we write all this out, we will be able to compute the, uh, the cost for any, for any policy. So, in this case we have computed it for the policy d u for uh, agent 1 and the policy l for agent 2. Right. So, this therefore gives us, uh, uh, gives us a way of computing the optimal policy even for problems in which we have noisy information. So, the lesson here is that one does not really need to model noise separately you know one the, the original model of a static team problem and the intrinsic model of stochastic control actually has in it enough generality to, uh, in, uh, to absorb all the elements of noise in the problem uh, into the environmental randomness. So, one does not need to have separately a no, uh, you know noisy observations or any of that listed out. The, so, this is one of the in fact one of the benefits of, of the intrinsic model and it helps uh, why and it uh, also makes clear why it is so, uh, so elegant as far as analyzing information structures is concerned. So, in the, in the, uh, in the next parts of uh, in the remaining parts of the course we will we will go for uh, we will we will uh, discuss uh, some more of other types of uh, problems where uh, where dynamic information structures come up in particular problems uh, problems of communication.